Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to The Silburn Show. And today I've got a very interesting guest. She's an author, and um, there's much more about her. And of course, we're going to talk about La Petite Negresse. Am I correct, Shep? That's beautifully said. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is Sheila Farrell, and we're going to have a very interesting discussion. But most importantly, we're going to talk about La Petite, La Petite Negresse. And of course, you'll take some time as well to understand and to learn French. Is it in French? <laughs> you know. The title's really franglais. Yes. Because uh, La Petite uh, is uh, French, but yes. Negresse without an E is actually English. So you should view it as an English title. It's an yes. English title. Okay. Yes, very much well, so. Welcome. Thank you for having me on the show, Sylvain. Fantastic. Sylvan. Now, it's very interesting about La Petite Negresse. La Petite mm -hmm. Negresse. Mm -hmm. When I got the book, and uh, you sent it to me, um, I think we spoke sometime maybe seven years ago, five, Indeed, seven Indeed, yes, it was, yes. Yeah, and you didn't tell me this, and I was going through the book, as you normally read the acknowledgements, and I said, hey, damn, my name is in the book, Silburn City. I said, wow, my name has never been in the book, actually, um, in this respect, and I, and I was very pleased, you know. Well, thank you. No, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, all the early people, I remember when I was writing this book in yeah. the early days, in the early drafts, yes. I would read it to friends. You were a friend yeah. and yes. uh, I, I thank them. <laughs> yeah. and, and because of the time when you, when you were talking about the book, actually, Shayla, um, I actually could have pictured the book, you know, I actually pictured the book, like the mist tonight and the, the atmosphere. Mm. And I saw that coming out of the book. But before we go there, I want to talk about your illustrious career in entertainment, you know. A lot of young actors and performers, especially those of colour and women, and in particular often feel it is hard to catch within the UK entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. However, you have managed to navigate this because you're, you're into acting as well. Indeed, yes, yeah. yes. My uh, early career I yeah. was a, an what, what has been your, your strategy and advice um, in regards to this particular career at this time? With, the whole aspect of um, social media and everybody want to get into acting. Yes, um, acting is a very competitive industry and yes. my strategy was to train, you know, yes. to go to college, to train thoroughly and yes. learn my craft mm -hmm. so that I would have the best um, chance of competing in a very competitive industry. Yes. Yeah, that was my strategy, train, as much as you can, learn your craft. And do you think that craft is something which is um, very prevalent now with lots of people, especially young people? Um, is, it, is it the same standard or is standard as slipped in certain respects? I don't think so. I think there's still really high standards in, mm. in, in acting, um, in theatre um, and on television. I think the standards are still there. The, yeah. the uh, colleges, the drama schools, um, I think they're, they're very good at keeping up the standard, yeah, yes. Yeah. There has been a very interesting topic in the air now, and uh, before we touch on to your book, but, you know, the, the likes of Kevin Spacey, Harvey Weinstein, and, you know, the whole topic of sexual harassment and abuse within the entertainment industry by people mm -hmm. of power, mm -hmm. producers, directors, mm -hmm. prominent actors, um, this is a fundamental issue. From a female perspective, how do we even begin to tackle this issue, Sheila? Because should this not be as commonly occurring as an issue as in 2017? Well, I think to, uh, as a female, uh, to tackle the issue, I think it starts with education, especially of women, yeah. you know, and that's um, to have confidence mm -hmm. and to, we, we have to educate our, our young children to be able to say no yeah. and to agree that that is an acceptable thing to do. But I always think of it this way. I always ask the question, do you think you are more likely to get a career progression mm -hmm. if you actually um, succumb to harassment yeah. or if you fight it? Now, maybe you're frightened you're going to lose your job. So what? Mm -hmm. Get another one. It doesn't matter. But I believe you're less likely to lose your job. Mm -hmm. I think you'll make people frightened of you if you say no. I found it interesting that Angelina Jolie said that she chose not to work uh, with uh, the man in question yes. after he approached her and it hasn't affected her yes. career. So I, I believe the same thing. I, 
I don't think it will correct, um, affect your career yeah. if you stand up to bullies and if you stand up to abusers. So therefore, it seems like the word need to really get out there to young, peop young uh, people who are getting into the film industry, but also into politics or in the whole scheme of things, because the men mm. of power or women of power mm -hmm. seems to be the one that somehow holds that next level for going to the next stage, if anything. And because of that now, I mean, uh, Anne Robinson recently said, what did she say? Come on, ladies, get tough up, man. What's the big deal if someone touch you? Just tell him to butt off or something like that. Be very firm. Yes, yeah. You know, but it seems as if now, many times ago, like people, young people, people don't want to affect their progress, their, their rise to stardom by accepting these advances. What, you think the attitude is changing? Well, or? I believe this, what is happening now is going to make a fundamental change because it seems that this has been happening because guess what? Everybody's coming out now, so why weren't they coming out before? Well, I guess fear, but I think the moral of the story is, is care about yourself. Don't, yeah. care, don't care if you offend people. Yeah. Care about yourself. Right, Your right, own, right. you know, integrity mm. and... Uh, self-esteem so yeah. what you're saying now for anybody who's actually getting into the film industry or whatever like that you just be firm mm. um, don't accept any shortcuts because guess what if you're going to get that job or whatever you'll get it if you're good enough yes and if they want you you're going to get it mm. anyway yeah if you're not the right person you're not going to get it anyway yeah. so it's it for me succumbing to to bullies is a lose-lose situation if you were going to get that job, you'll get it. Mm -hmm. If they want you enough, you could shout and scream, you'll still get that job if, if you're right and you're good enough and they want you. So, and, That's what I and, believe. And therefore, if they get the job by succumbing to some advances or whatever like that, that means to say you really didn't get the job in the right way. And chances are... Wow, well, I mean, everybody has to make a choice and a decision mm. and they have to live with whatever, whatever the decision is. I think I'm here to promote, don't be afraid to say no, yes. that's the important thing. If someone chooses to do that, what can I say? I'm not going to judge anybody, yes. but um, d I don't believe my message really to young people is don't get bullied yes. into something you don't want to do. Right, right. Walk out, say no, it doesn't matter. They'll probably come running after you actually. Good. Walk out, <laughs> say no. That's awesome. Yeah. La petite negress. Yes. You're excited, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Actually, that's why you're here and I just, I just deep diverted because of that's the okay. topic. La petite negress. What was the inspiration, um, Sheila? Well, La Petite Negresse is uh, Sorry, set in... Sorry, I have to stop you right there because I see that excitement. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it something which... Keep talking. I mean, but I'm just, I mean, people can see that excitement, yeah. La Petite Negresse. It was set... It is set in 1772. Yeah. And um, I was inspired to write the story when I was looking at our history, black history, and I discovered the... Um, about the James Somerset case yes. of 1772. And for those of you who don't know about the James Somerset case, uh, basically uh, he was a slave brought over to this country with his master from Virginia. Yes. While here, he ran away. And, in, uh, the in the UK. In the UK. In, it, it, would have, it wouldn't have been the UK then, it would have yeah. been called Britain. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. While in England, he ran away. Yes. And uh, he was, uh, a year later, he was caught by his master, yes. who then tried to have him deported mm -hmm. to Jamaica with a view to having him resold. Right. Um, Somerset had friends who took the matter to court and the presiding judge was Lord Mansfield, Lord Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. And he ruled that there was no provision in uh, English common law that allowed anybody basically to deport a man against his will. Mm -hmm. And so, and he set Somerset free. Yes. But what this highlighted was the fact that slavery had never been uh, authorised in statute in this country. Mm. It never was. Um, there were cases, this was not the first case to show this. Uh, slavery was outlawed in this country uh, by the Magna Carta in mm. uh, 1215. Yes. Um, 
So how did we have a slave trade if it was illegal in this country? I mean, there were people who believed once you set foot in England, you were free. Mm -hmm. um, and it, from what I can deduce, basically they got round the trade, of course, by classifying uh, African, uh, you know, uh, tr uh, slaves as chattel. Exactly. Not humans. Not humans. Yes. It's the only way they got round the trade. But once you were on this on this earth, mm -hmm. it was hard. You couldn't justify it in law yes. in England. And this is a, I interesting. Uh, I, I've lived in America for six years, and it makes me realise that, in fact, I feel that I'm more protected by law in England than, than possibly in America, because American, yeah. the American Constitution was founded on colonial law, and slavery had been legalized in the colonies. And also in the States as well, a human being or an African or a slave was deemed to be uh, one third human or something like Three that. Three fifths of a man. Three fifths of a man. Um, that was, uh, yes, that was under that. It was founded yes. under that pre premise that, so, uh, that uh, yes, yeah. a black so, man was three fifths. Three yeah. Man, so, yeah. so what is the message then? I mean, I mean, it is non-fiction, part fiction, half fiction, three fiction. Well, something <laughs> very up, well. Yes. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Yes. It wasn't. Is, even, is it? Is it? Is it this closer? Am I getting? Exclusive you're getting here? closer. <laughs> Do you know? It wasn't even just that case that fascinated me. Yeah. What fascinated me was that I I discovered in the newspaper article, J June, 1772, in the Gazette they announced that there was a ball at mm. Westminster Hall in which 200 blacks and their ladies attended mm -hmm. this ball. And the tickets were five shillings each. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what got my little grey cells going. Yes. I want to know who were these people yes. that attended this ball. And what year was that? That was 1772. 1772. And it says, uh, you know, 200 blacks and their ladies attended. Who were they? Where did they get the money? Mm. I've done research. Five shillings would have bought you a box at Drury Lane Theatre. Mm. That's a lot of money. Mm. So where did they get this money? So in that, I wanted to write a, a, a fictional tale yes. with that happening in the background that, you know, basically the Somerset case was the hottest news happening when my character and her brother actually land in England and mm. uh, it's basically an adventure of how they negotiate their lives here in England at it, that it, time. It's interesting um, because when, when, when I was reading the book and mm. I've read all of it you know and um, yes you should beat me for that <laughs> <laughs> when I say that you know but but I actually got all of the book before verbally and orally yes. from yourself, you know. Yeah. But going through it um, to where it said whereby they came off the boat and uh, yes. they're dancing, yes, uh, and you know is that an African dance or something like that? They're Jigs, just jiggling um, and stuff like that. I see. I see a movie actually. Well, lots of, lots of people too. I mean, basically, <laughs> when they you know this is my story. When they arrive here, they can't get work, you mm. know. And uh, but to keep up their spirits. They just dance to yes. themselves, I, and I don't know how they dance. They mm. just dance freely, and uh, out in the open. That um, you know, and that's basically how La Petite's fortune, good fortune, changes yes. because somebody spots them. And, and what and what is it that people? What, what is the message that you actually want persons to get? Because books are books, but mm. in books there is some gem, some key ingredient that you want persons to leave with after they engage with La Petite Negres? Well, La Petite really is about relationships. It's really about kindness. Um, but I think for everybody who reads it, it doesn't matter f f where you're from. Yes. What I wanted to do was to start to normalise the presence of, uh, of blacks in uh, Britain at that time. Right. Um, that they weren't, you know, not necessarily slaves. Perhaps they had a slave history, but really that we don't think of uh, blacks in historical England as an exceptional yes. case. You know, there was an exception that one was here, an yes. exception. No, the fact that there were really a significant number yes. here going about their business. Going through the process, yes. Going about their business, working, you know, uh, living their lives. And I think... You know, I, I in in this story, you'll read it just feeling that here is somebody, yes. you know, 
living their life mm. in, in, in England. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break and come back to you. And I'm going to talk some bit more about uh, storytelling with Sheila. The tragic murder of Stephen Lawrence did lead to a sea change yeah. in the recommendations which were implemented and partly mm. because we managed to get over Eric Holder who was the US Attorney General yeah. and there were some negotiations and pressure put on the UK yeah. government yeah. by the US of all people. And I think the major political parties don't want to see black representation. Mm. You know, I, I don't think the conservative whips, mm. liberal uh, Labour whips, would like to see a cross-party unity, unity amongst people of colour. I mean, my father came from Sierra Leone. Yes. I never lived there, although visited. Mm. And I worked with the UN in Tanzania for mm. several years and thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. And so going to live in Nairobi, with all its problems, and Kenya mm. has some significant problems, but it, I think it dwarfs the UK, isn't it? it well, well, the UK yes, is dwarfed for it, whatever it, it, yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's a tragedy when anybody loses their life in any form of violence, mm. let alone political violence. Petite Negress, and the part I'm about to read is when she's dancing and uh, she's spotted by a proprietor of a pub who uh, thinks he can make some money out of her and tries to negotiate with her brother. But La Petite is not happy at all. La Petite, on seeing him negotiating, grows extremely cross. Now listen, sir, who say him here were boss? Stunned, her brother pulls her aside, looks his sister in the eye, orders her to keep quiet and play dumb. But La Petite is not prepared to stand and twiddle her thumb. Directly in defiance of him, she immediately decides to muscle in. Now, sir, what you do and what you want? The man appears nonchalant as he moves his umbrella to shelter her from the rain. Her brother quickly tries to explain. Him like the way you dance, you see. Him want you to go dance in the big city. Me? And what about you, she says. Her brother sadly shakes his head. La Petite does not like the sound of his plan, turns her face, turns, uh, sorry, turns her face, looks sternly at the man. Now, sir. If you want me to dance for you, you have to take me and my brother too. Her furious brother begins to feel his sister's about to blow the deal. What you doing, sis, playing the fool? What the hell is wrong with you? This is your chance for some security. Wherever I go, she says, you're coming with me. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, you may have enjoyed that sample from Sheila as she read a bit of La Petite Negresse. Sheila, welcome. Thank you. Back. Now listen, storytelling. What is the significance of um, storytelling? Because your book is a lot about story um, in black history and etc. How do you see the significance of storytelling? Well, I think a good story helps you remember yeah. um, an event. Um, it's interesting, when I was in, I started writing long poems when I was in Jamaica and I mm. learned about Nanny of the Maroons mm -hmm. and I didn't want to forget her story so I sort of drafted it down in a poem and it's yeah. much easier to remember things in a good story yes. or, or in a poem but in a story. Mm. Um, I, I think that's the significance, it's yeah. an old fashioned form of uh, giving information, yes. um, storytelling. It's the oldest form of communication. And this is one of the ways as well as uh, um, African slaves actually kept their history together, mm -hmm. the roots, and pass it down upon generation to generation. Negro spiritual movement, folk songs, and all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And your books somewhat sort of bring that out, I believe, with the picturing. Indeed. You know? Yes, picturing, imagining, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully, you know, when somebody reads La Petite Negress, suddenly they will pitch, as you say, imagine mm. uh, a black person, her and her mm. brother, the story follows mm. not just her, it follows her brother too, um, rooted in, on British soil, mm. and it, hopefully it will feel organic, it won't feel forced. Yeah, 
And the whole aspect of documenting and distributing the black history element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, many people sometimes say that the reason why sometimes black history is not actually shared a lot is because it's not very interesting. I mean, children maybe do not enjoy it. Um, so they have, it, years ago, they would say the um, Tony Blair and the dossier, Alex, Alistair Campbell, say it is sexed up, you know, um, figuratively saying that the, it needs to be a bit more intriguing, more in enticing, more interesting. Do you believe that La Petite Negresse will sort of generate that sort of effort? Wow, I, I, I've, I haven't heard, heard that before. Mm. That's, new to, me. That's because, new to me. Because you see, black history is something which is relegated to once a month of mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. in the UK, mm -hmm. October. Mm -hmm. Once a month a year in the United States, February. And sometimes they say, why is it not teached? Why many people don't understand it? There's a person who went to a school, 20 children mm. were there. And he said, black children, give us the first thing that you think of when you hear black history. And 19 of them said, transatlantic slavery. Sure. Mm. Right? So therefore, there's this perception that it is from that particular point. So therefore, there need to be this element whereby it goes beyond. How can that? Do you believe like the work of La Petite Negresse can somehow be a part of that solution? I think it's important that we talk about the truth of black history mm -hmm. in its wider context, yes. um, in terms of European history. Mm -hmm. I mean, British history doesn't happen outside of European history. And when you go back in time and you understand the Moors of, uh, of North Africa yes. actually occupied Spain from, you know, 711 AD mm. right up until 1492 when they were finally sort of expelled. Mm. That's over 700 years. Yes. And you, when you look at the logic of that, if you had, you know, Berbers, uh, North Africans mm -hmm. in Spain, um, then they must have moved to do trade. Yes. Countries trade, they've been trading from the 700s mm. so you would have seen you know blacks moving to italy yes. up to austria to england uh, this is you know before the slave trade got underway and then the slave trade really started with the spanish and the portuguese yes. um they were the first to colonize you know from jamaica yeah. you know jamaica Columbus, yeah. Indeed, 1492, but the Brits didn't really take... Uh, was in that? They weren't, not in to, they weren't there until the Brit British didn't win over Jamaica until mm. 1655. Mm. That's much later. Yeah, yeah. and that's why I had the war between, as, as we got Spanish town and then the whole issue with Britain and England. But Indeed, but, yeah. so when you come up to, 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 to black history in, in Europe, you will have, you know, people have mentioned before that in Queen Elizabeth's time, uh, it was deemed that there were so many blacks in, in uh, England that she yeah. wanted to expel them. Well, you don't want to expel people if there aren't very many mm. there. It was, I don't know if it was her, actually. It was a lot of opportunist businessmen mm. who mm. thought that they could actually profit yes. by uh, getting rid of uh, the blacks and, and selling them. But mm. their masters wouldn't actually give them up. Well, they said that uh, many times ago that um, the Arawak and were saying that when Christopher Columbus came, when Christopher Columbus um, found for the purpose of the, the Spanish, yes. found for the purpose of the yes, Spanish. Yes, indeed, yeah. But, but for, for the Caribbean, he was, the Caribbean yeah. people discovered him, um, that there were Africans actually already doing trading already between the Caribbean, in a sense, and Africa, or rather the West Indies. And well, we've got to even understand about Christ Christopher Cl Columbus. He was coming up off of the back of the, no the Moors mm. inhabiting Spain and Portugal. Yes. So uh, it's m probable and highly probable that half the knowledge and the technology he that he used at the time was, you know, developed by the Moors. Yes. Uh, it's highly probable that he would have had blacks on that expedition as, as well. well. Yes. So when you understand the whole of the history, at one point, the Spanish population was about 50-50 blacks mm, mm. and whites at that and, time. And, and that is very interesting, Shayla. That is the reason why, and I go into this whole aspect of black history and black history month. Uh, should it be something which is once 
uh, Amanda for a year because there's so much gem, so much information. I'm learning things because I'm coming from Jamaica whereby mm. we learn about our national heroes, we mm. learn about slavery, we learn about Africa has been there before. Mm. But as you're getting older and as you've got children and you start to dig a bit deeper, you're learning so much more. Timbuktu. When people sometimes say Timbuktu from a Jamaica perspective, mm. and one is, mm. uh, anyone mm. from Jamaica goes, uh, man, they come from Timbuktu, go back to Timbuktu, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, but it, 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 it was not deemed as something very positive, it was deemed as something derogatory. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about it deep, go back to Timbuktu. It's like you're going back into the origin. Mm -hmm. And that is something a lot of persons don't know about. And that's why I say, let's do it once per week. Let's do black history once per week where parents, children, take their time out with some key tools, like Petit Negres, one of those books, to understand and to know one's history. Yes, and I think it's really important as well that we don't start, uh, w when you're British and black, that you don't feel that you have to sort of um, take on board the American narrative yeah. as your own. Yeah. We have our own narrative, and I think my experience of living in America, that became clear that uh, as a black British person, I have my own narrative, yeah. which is very different from the American narrative. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, our, our narrative is often linked to the Caribbean, in my case it is, mm. and uh, going to Jamaica, when we're talking about black history, um, it was interesting to me that the Maroon Wars, yeah. which were fought by the British, but of course they lost, don't appear in any history book here in England. Yeah. If I hadn't gone to Jamaica, I would never have known of the Maroon Wars. And I had to be educated by my mm. cousin's gardener. And he, he was the one yeah. who actually educated me yeah. about Nanny of the Maroons. I had no idea yes. that she existed. And did you know how they came about with jerk pork and jerking? I don't know. Actually, it, 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 was, it was a way that the Maroons used to cook. Oh, and right. they had it down under low yeah. because so the British wouldn't actually see the smoke or something Interesting. like that. Interesting. No, I didn't know that. Actually, I actually, know that. actually oh. saw it on a program with Miss Dynamite, with the understanding yeah. the Maroons and a compound town and all those sort of things. Yeah. So there's a lot of history there, yes. which we, I believe, it's incumbent upon us to actually share these yes. as much as possible. Yes. Yeah. And I've been up to Maroon Town. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's to Acompong. Yeah, it, it's funny. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a different country in Jamaica, you know that? It's amazing. I do. Yeah, yes, I do. Yes. They've got their own treaties and everything like that. Indeed. You know? In and fact, they told me, why didn't I stay and marry a Maroon? And all oh, this will be mine, wow, I was wow, told. All wow, oh, wow. this would be mine. Well, well listen, listen, <laughs> listen. Before we go, I and um, <laughs> Le Petit Negres, um, you know, this is an interesting book. And yes. What, what's one of the last feature or thing you'd want to say to the viewers about why they should get Le Petit Negres? Most of all, you should get La Petite Negres because it is a very entertaining and enjoyable mm. read, uh, more than anything. Um, yes. Yes. I think that's the most important, to be entertained. Yes. And from my as well as educated, and from my perspective, because my name is in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 no, no honestly speaking, um, I, I've learned a bit about the book before when um, Shayla was actually telling me about it, and I actually could picture the book and just reading the bits of it there. Actually, it came alive, and and that's very important, Shayla, to capture something from the thinking process, get it into words and then someone can actually visualize it. So it's from the dream to the vision to the reality. Yes. So therefore, the book, ladies and gentlemen, as I always say this, and this is gonna something I'm gonna say again, anyone who follows me on Facebook Live or whatever, you can have a dream, you can have a vision, but it's only powerful when you wake up. And this is a waking up process. It's awake. It's no more a dream now, it's a reality. Indeed. Right. Yeah. Shayla, listen, before we go, what is any last word, what, what is any sort of mantra or any um, positive words or quote that you have that you can, we always ask our guests that thing, something that you can leave with our um, viewers, something that inspires you, something in that moment sometimes when you're down or whatever, what picks you up, something that you can leave with our viewers. Could be one, could be two or three, but just use the top one. Uh, 
the top law, well, people say always look on the bright side, and I do do that, but there's something else that I do. Yes. I was very, very fortunate as a child to uh, be educated at a very prestigious boarding school where I believe I don't remember hearing the word no, mm. and I think that's really important, especially for dreams, yes. that don't hear the word no, mm. just work out a way that you can do it, wow. you know. I think that's important because wow. I, I, I grew up at a stage where uh, a lot of parents um, with their children might have said, you know, don't have ideas above your mm. station. Mm. And I don't believe that. I think you should have ideas <laughs> above yeah. your, uh, uh, your station. Uh, don't say no. Yeah. If you want to do it, just work out yes. how you can do it. So work it is, out a way. So it is similar to when they say, don't put your hat where you can't reach it. I always say, I hate that song so much. Yeah. I always say, you need to put your hat where you really can't reach it so you aspire. Aspire. And you just work the way. Yes. You get a ladder. Yes. Put the hat there yes. and get a ladder yes. to get there. Yeah. So what you're That's saying then, when you, when, ladies and gentlemen, when we hear, don't hear the word no. Yes. It's actually, it may be sounded. Somebody may say it, but you don't hear it. Don't hear it. No. That's, the, that's the perception. The, the, once yeah. it's perceived. They say once it's perceived, it's conceived, isn't it? In, indeed, yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Sheila, listen, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you for awesome. having me on the show. And ladies it's and been gentlemen. lovely being here. Awesome, Thank you. awesome. And ladies and gentlemen, um, Sheila is going to be giving away a book later, and um, we're going to do a little um, challenge as to who is going to get the book. So keep a lookout for that. And don't go anywhere. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining the Silburn Show. And again, I want to thank my guest, Sheila Farrell, for being on the show and about La Petite Negresse. Remember to tune in and to like, subscribe to the Silburn Show on YouTube, Instagram, and all the different social network channels. And see you next time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sheila Farrell. I'm the author of La Petite Negresse. And as a special treat just for you, I'm giving away a signed copy to the first person who can answer the following question. What was the name of Henry VIII's black trumpeter? Good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Silburn Show. And uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos, share the videos, and subscribe to the channel. Let people know about it. But the important thing is also to comment. Let us get your comment, let us get your views, so we can understand how to even please you better, ladies and gentlemen. So as I said, share, like, subscribe. Ah, thank you, I saw you there. You subscribe and you shared. Thank you so much, see you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and I'm the man with the madman, Shaq. Sorry, that's a good